All right. Good evening, everyone. I thank you, first of all, for taking the time to join me on this um, Monday evening. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, of course, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on across all of the sites wherever you're sitting and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging leaders. Tonight we're speaking about anxiety disorders and this is at a time where really our world has changed. Um, fundamentally, um, what we knew the world to be in January and February this year is no longer the case and many people that I meet, um, and I'm certainly sure that people who come to your practice um, are presenting with um, an array of issues, um, many of which I believe will be related to their experience of anxiety. So we're going to kick off tonight by just walking through um, a little bit about anxiety disorders and, and why they're actually relevant to you as um, primary care uh, practitioners and, and thinking a little bit about the sort of broader issues that relate um, to some of the anxiety disorders, but also talking a fair bit about um, treatment. Um, as was mentioned before, there's an opportunity for a poll and I have to confess those were two polls that I asked to be put in and they really related to how confident you are in relation to um, treating people presenting with anxiety disorders and also um, how successful uh, you have been. So what's your experience in actually uh, managing people with anxiety disorders? So we know that people who present in primary care and of course to myself as well um, with anxiety disorders have a much higher prevalence of hypertension and other cardiovascular uh, conditions. And we see people presenting with an array of gastrointestinal conditions, rheumatoid conditions, thyroid disease, respiratory disease, migraines, headaches, um, allergic conditions. And, and we know that those problems are much more prevalent amongst people with anxiety disorders. Um, and that, that presents a challenge for you in clinical practice because when people are presenting with a physical health condition as well as a comorbid anxiety disorder, sometimes actually elucidating what, what it is that you're um, facing and what you're challenging and what you actually have to be treating um, uh, can be a clinical challenge. We also know that these conditions um, are associated with significant impacts on a person's quality of life, on their productivity, um, and of course their interpersonal functioning as well as their capacity to hold down jobs. So we'll be touching on that as we move through this talk this evening. So I'm going to start off with uh, just talking a little bit about generalised anxiety disorder. Um, it's a condition that it's pretty common. It affects about 6% of people and it's more frequent in women than in men. Um, and there's a bimodal distribution. And it's interesting because there's a late teen peak and an early uh, 20 sort of uh, association. So you've got late teens and early 20s and then again in 30s and 40s. And it's a disorder that is associated with significant uh, financial impairment and a high prevalence of comorbid psychiatric and, and medical um, disorders. When I think about generalised anxiety disorder, one of the key questions I ask people is, so just tell me when you're sitting in bed at night or lying in bed at night, do you have that experience where you're thinking out all the worst case outcomes of every scenario, you're thinking through all the various permutations and combinations and you're getting stuck with worry. You experience physical symptoms, sweating, tachycardia, uh, restlessness, agitation. Oftentimes I'll see people with generalised anxiety disorder and one of the primary um, complaints that they may have or their partners may have is that they're irritable when they have to make decisions, they become easily overwhelmed. They see situations as threatening even when they aren't and they get they, they really struggle with uncertainty. And so they, they have a sense of being indecisive and that truly impacts on a person's sense of self-esteem and um, they feel generally um, that they aren't efficacious, that they cannot make uh, decisions and that the worry essentially continues to magnify um, and is out of proportion to the impact of the events. I'll often see people who present with generalised anxiety having experienced perhaps social anxiety, shyness or a, a shy temperament um, in adolescence and over time perhaps either they have developed a social anxiety disorder which I'll talk about a little bit later and then that over time can develop into a generalised anxiety um, disorder. It's particularly common um, and co-occurs with major depressive disorders and I often see it when I'm working with people with bipolar disorder because of the uncertainty in terms of the stability of their mood leads to the generation of uh, quite significant um, experience of not being able to control their thoughts of um, concern about the outcomes of every decision they make. They also present with an array of physiological symptoms such as fatigue and trouble sleeping 
muscle aches and pains, um, noticing, you know, the little fasciculations in their um, orbicularis over here, just little twitches. Um, and, and people notice this and, 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 and patients often will um, be concerned that they have fasciculations and, and that their muscles twitch and, and tremble. Um, they also, uh, one of the questions I ask people is if the door slams, do you jump? So they're very easily startled. They have high levels of hyperarousal um, and often uh, present complaining of nausea or diarrhea or irritable bowel syndrome. So it's quite challenging to, um, I guess, develop the guts to turn up to um, your GP and, and tell them that you're not as effective as you used to be and, and that you have all these worries and that you get stuck with worry. And um, people find that they get to a point of loss of productivity, loss of interpersonal functioning. And because of that, um, they seek help. And so it's not a condition to be taken lightly because it is, uh, as I mentioned um, just a minute ago, it's associated with significant uh, morbidity and a significant loss of um, quality of life. Um, I wanted to uh, address, and I'm going to the way I'm going to structure this talk is just talk about first line agents, what to do when people present, um, and certainly with anyone that I meet, I first start talking to them about their symptom profile. I try to help them understand. Um, and oftentimes I'll use websites, for example, like the, there's a really great website called the Mayo Clinic um, website, which actually puts the symptoms and signs of generalized anxiety disorder into an, an understandable sort of layman's terms. And I, I help people understand that these conditions are fairly common, that help is available, but it, it generally involves both pharmacology and um, psychotherapy. And for people that I'll see, um, the level of impairment is quite significant associated with the generalized anxiety disorder. And um, I think if you, you know, it, one of the most common things that people with generalized anxiety disorder, when they fill in my sort of pre-consult questionnaire, is that they have a sense that their health problems haven't been taken seriously. And that's because they present with physiological signs, cognitive symptoms, um, and, and this really strong sense of loss of efficacy. So in terms of the evidence base and what medications work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, SSRIs first of all, so medications like escitalopram, um, paroxetine, um, and uh, sertraline have a really good first line evidence base in treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. The way I work is, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I work is that I spend time educating people about the effects and side effects of these medications, and I'll give them a a sheet to take away because if you can imagine if you're physiologically um, experiencing symptoms of generalized anxiety and you also have these cognitive symptoms just the notion of taking a medication and by the time I see people it's not the first or second it's usually their third or fourth or fifth medication and so their experience of taking another medication makes their anxiety worse what happens if they're not a treatment responder uh, what about the sexual side effects of these medications which are fairly common you know around 10 percent or so uh, what happens if, if it impacts on um, their ability to control their bowels, which are already disturbed by the generalized anxiety um, issues that they have. There are other medications aside from the SSRIs, and certainly the M1, um, M2 receptor, um, agonist um, agomelatine. Uh, and there's actually a question um, that came in um, before the start of this talk about um, agomelatine. Um, look, it's a, it's a reasonable antidepressant, it's a reasonable um, anti-anxiety agent, and it certainly has um, an evidence base in the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. Um, it certainly can impact on liver function and I always do a baseline um, LFTs before I start somebody on this medication and then depending on what you read but generally either three or four weeks and then I'll do four, eight, twelve um, and then I'll uh, repeat their LFTs at about um, 12 weeks. Thus far I've seen one person with deranged LFTs in the range where I'd, I'd stop um, the agomelatine, but I actually sent them along to a hepatologist who told me to keep going and just monitor. So I guess getting advice, um, the guidelines do suggest that if there's a tripling in terms of um, gamma GT, AST, ALT, then you probably need to be stopping the medication. But if you if you have a hepatologist handy as somebody who's prepared to consult, uh, because for this person, they truly hadn't responded to anything else. Um, Pregabalin is also, um, described as a first line agent. And certainly um, my experience with Lyrica is that it is um, a lovely anti-anxiety agent. My major concern with this medication is that if people do suffer from a comorbid um, depressive disorder, then I generally wouldn't recommend it 
And whilst gabapentin is not traditionally um, recommended, uh, as a specialist, I'm going to step over the line and say that gabapentin, although it has to be taken TDS, um, is a medication that hasn't been associated with exacerbation of depressive symptoms in the context of anxiety disorders. And I often prescribe a TDS dose. And what I'll do with that is I'll start at 100 milligrams at night and build up to 300 milligrams at night to counter the sedative effects. And then I'll slowly build the dose up further, um, introducing a mana and midi dose and get people to 300 milligrams TDS. The top end of the range I'll go to is around about 600 milligrams TDS. And I find it quite effective, particularly for people who can't tolerate SSRIs or NSRIs. And Effexor is one, uh, venlafaxine is one um, SSRI that certainly has a good, good quality evidence base in the context of GAD, as does duloxetine. There in a way, are, there's an array of um, second line agents. And um, I'll point you to a paper after this where you can have a look at it. It's in a lovely, um, sort of table form that, that provides sort of advice as to um, what can be helpful. But as a general rule, the benzodiazepines, they, they should be used only in the short term. Um, oftentimes I break my own rule because I'm seeing people who are very functionally impaired and highly comorbid and at times I'll continue a medication like lorazepam. And I use that medication um, to assist with breakthrough anxiety specifically because it has no active metabolites. Um, and is, is reasonably well tolerated. And I'll often co-prescribe it early on, particularly if people have a severe symptom profile, just to, call, just to produce some anxiolysis in the first seven to 14 days until these medications, the SSRIs or NSRIs, actually start to um, help. But in general, people will have to wait four to six or even longer, four to six weeks or even longer before um, the medications will start to affect symptom reduction. In a subset of people, um, I, I do see more rapid response, but in, if you tell people it's going to take a while and you start to make the referrals out, you get a mental health plan in place and you think about referring them on uh, for some psychological work and you provide them with education and point them to a few websites, that really does start the education process and, and, and people develop a sense of understanding of what's happening to them and that helps to reduce the anxiety. Um, quetiapine extended release also has an evidence base as a second line um, agent. Uh, I tend to not use that as a monotherapy unless I've seen people who can't tolerate um, any of the SSRIs or NSRIs. And then I, I do see a, a moderate effectiveness. Um, but certainly um, as an adjunctive treatment to first line treatments, SSRIs or NSRIs, if you want to stay away from um, benzos, if there's a comorbid history of substance use, then um, oftentimes I will use a, a low dose of quetiapine XR, spending time letting people know that um, you know the sedative, sedative effects are fairly profound um, and that weight gain um, certainly can be an issue. And so sometimes if I'm seeing somebody who has a significant concern in relation to weight gain, I'll often start them on diaform and SR, uh, which has a good quality evidence base with a couple of nice um, meta-analysis showing that it, it, at the very least, counter psychotropic induced weight gain, but can also affect weight loss in the order of about three to four kilograms. And the dose range for that is 500 milligrams up to two grams a day. And I just track um, renal function with that, let them know that some of the side effects of the medication align with um, the uh, physiological symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and about 3% of people can experience a taste disturbance. So I, I like to brief my um, anxiety disorder patients really well on what can happen with medications because then that reduces their level of anxiety the number of times they'll be contacting me about side effects of medication. Um, beta blockers are not recommended. Um, so propranolol is not recommended for this group. Um, the evidence base is fairly poor. There's a, uh, a couple of reasonable RCTs that show that um, it's not effective. So I generally tend not to um, recommend them. So if you think about um, generalized anxiety disorder, if you think about, uh, I've got a, a lovely table that we'll, um, I'll make available to you, but I like to think a little bit about the economic loss associated uh, with the conditions I'm treating. And um, generalized anxiety disorder is associated with at least, you know, for the 27 to 35 days a year in terms of uh, economic loss. If you think of it, about the numbers needed to treat, it's about five. Um, the suicide risk is increased by 50% for people um, with generalized anxiety disorder. And in terms of um, psychological therapies, um, meta-analyses are often tricky in this regard, but RCTs generally show that 
the combination of CBT um, together with pharmacological treatment is um, probably most effective. And the prognosis is relatively um, good as long as people stay on medication, but most people still report some symptoms um, after 10 years. And without medication, the relapse rate's about 50%. So in terms of psychological therapies, we know that CBT is definitely an effective um, first line option for people who do not want medication. Um, and it is shown to be as effective as pharma pharmacotherapy, especially for people in that sort of mild to moderate range. And there are a range of internet based and uh, computer based CBT um, therapies and, and they have good uh, quality um, efficacy that has been demonstrated in, in randomized controlled trials. Um, and uh, so names are like, for example, Frances K. Lemkin um, has done, uh, she's a New South Wales researcher and she's done a lot of work in this area. Um, if you're thinking about sort of stratifying treatment, pharmacotherapy should start with SSRIs. And then if you have tolerability issues or lack of response, then I'd, I'd push along to NSRIs. It's important to remember that um, in general, if you're not getting a treatment response at a reasonable initiation dose, so for example, say 10 milligrams um, of, or 15 milligrams of escitalopram, or say 50 or 100 milligrams of sertraline, then pushing the dose probably isn't going to do that much. Um, we consider people who have had multiple uh, courses of therapy, so psychological therapy as well, well as pharmacotherapy, as being treatment refractory. Um, and first thing I'll do then is just reevaluate the diagnosis. What am I missing? What comor comorbidities am I missing? Um, and, and if I haven't missed anything, then essentially what I'll be doing is pushing down the line of using adjunctive therapy. So for example, quetiapine and, and um, being quite aggressive with that because of the functional impairment associated with generalized anxiety disorder. So look, what I wanted to do was just talk a bit about GAD and then give you the opportunity to just give us a sense of how confident you are in treating anxiety disorders in general. So I'm going to actually ask for the web poll to be opened up now and for you to have an opportunity to um, vote. All right. So thank you everyone for voting. Um, so look, I, it doesn't look like there's anyone who's very, very confident in treating anxiety disorders, but there's a fair spread um, in terms of a level of confidence in managing anxiety disorders. I guess I'm, I'm wondering though, how many of you um, feel as though you're not exactly sure who to refer on to um, a psychologist or when pharmacotherapy should be initiated or when you should actually refer somebody to a psychologist, um, link them in with CBT, for example, or a psychological therapy. Um, but I guess one of the things to think about is um, obviously patient preference, um, finances is a significant issue, and then access to psychological therapies. And um, I don't know about everyone um, who's attending tonight, but quite frankly, um, the uh, psychologist groups I'm working with are snowed under at the moment. Um, my recommendation is that if somebody is um, experiencing uh, symptoms sufficient for them to miss um, a couple of days of work every month or every two months, I would provide them with the option of um, pharmacotherapy. The worst thing that can happen is that they um, go for psychological therapy first and the psychologist comes back to you and says, look, their symptom profile is too severe. So in other words, their ability to actually work um, productively in psych psychological therapy is limited. And as a consequence of that, um, you know, they'll re recommend back to you um, that you start them on a low dose of an SSRI. And um, fundamentally, when I think of severe anxiety disorders and, and oftentimes the people that I'll see in my rooms, they are so functionally impaired that their capacity to um, maintain employment uh, is quite significantly impaired. So it's a value judgment and I think we should um, rightly um, offer people both psychological therapy and pharmacotherapy. Um, but be careful of the trap of somebody saying, well, look, help me sleep, give me some temazepam or let's, let's start with a um, 
a sedative medication so that I can continue to work because I don't want an SSRI. I've heard they've had a bad rap. And then you start you start down the track of producing anxiolysis with um, a benzodiazepine as the first line of treatment. And then you're, you're left in a situation where um, you then have to start to move that person away from um, believing that benzodiazepines is, is the predominant um, way that their, their illness should be managed and people can be, be really convincing. So I, I draw a very clear boundary um, in relation to that and I'll make sure that people understand that um, if we're looking at something beyond melatonin to help with sleep, so if we're looking at uh, benzodiazepine, then um, we really should not be considering that as anything but a short-term therapy in conjunction with the initiation of um, proper pharmacotherapy for their disorder. Um, so I thought I'd move on now and talk a little bit about social anxiety disorder because it's a pretty interesting one. I mean, um, tonight's been a bit different for me because usually when I stand up on stage and there's a lot of people in the audience, my heart rates and I, my heart races and I sweat a little bit. It's a bit strange sitting in front of a screen like this um, and, and actually it's much less anxiety provoking. And I'll take a couple of deep breaths and I'll calm myself down before I step on stage. But um, if you think about social anxiety disorder, it, it's one of the most common um, anxiety disorders. It's more common in females than in males, and it significantly impacts on quality of life and has significant impacts on um, functional and occupational um, outcomes. And is also quite as you know quite commonly associated with uh, comorbid disorders, as well as other anxiety disorders. So, for example, major depression. Um, but it's not unusual to see somebody with, say, panic attacks as well as um, social anxiety. And it's characterized by an intense fear um, or anxiety in relation to social or performance situations. And when I'm talking to people about it, one of the questions I'll ask them is, so before you go out, do you feel like you need to have a beer or a glass of wine before you go out? And if you can't have that or if you don't have that, your propensity to actually hop in a cab or, or go to a, a social context is, is limited or if you're given the option, will you avoid? And if they say yes to that, then I'll move on and I'll ask them, look, do you feel as though um, when you're in a social context that people will evaluate you negatively so they'll notice whether or not you're anxious? Um, and are you really careful about how you manage yourself in a social context? Because um, if you draw attention to yourself, then people will notice you're anxious. And, and if that answer is yes, then um, I ask them, well, after you leave a social context, A, firstly, do you leave early, if at all possible? And B, when you're sitting at home or you're lying in bed at night, are you pulling apart what you've said and are you ruminating on um, how awful what you have said is and, and how much embarrassment you've brought upon yourself by what you have said in the social context? So, you know, those are some of the core symptoms to look at. And I find when assessing anxiety disorders, this is a conversation. You really want to understand um, all of the factors that their anxiety disorder um, brings about in terms of their, you know, their, their cognitions, but also their, their physiological symptoms. So, you know, people with social anxiety report that they'll be they'll blush in a social context. Their their heart will thump and their their heartbeat will be fast, and they'll notice it thumping away in their chest. They'll be trembling, diaphoretic, um, or they'll experience nausea um, or feel short of breath. Um, oftentimes, people report dizziness or lightheadedness. Um, in conversation, they'll feel that their mind goes blank. It's just they, they lose their thought. Um, and that that is a very big trigger for people because in the context of a conversation, then um, their worst nightmare has come true and other people will then notice that they're anxious and that then leads to them um, oftentimes leaving social context. So people will ruminate and worry that people will notice that they'll be sweating in a social context. Um, and Oftentimes they'll report that they'll just endure those contexts with such intense um, anxiety and fear. And um, they'll spend their time expecting the worst outcome from every um, social context. And it's very challenging for people. Um, for kids though, um, they'll worry more about um, interacting with adults or peers. And um, oftentimes you'll see that there'll be a history of temper tantrums um, or they'll cling to their parents, um, for example, if they're going to school, um, and they'll often refuse to speak in social contexts. And 
it's really important to understand that I guess social anxiety can lead to the ev evolution of you know really significant problems like school refusal if it's not recognized early and for kids obviously we the first line is not to recommend pharmacotherapy but to um, engage them with a you know a good child and adolescent psychologist who can work with the family system and the child so if we're talking about adults um, we need to be thinking about comorbid major depressive disorder and substance use disorder, as well as other anxiety disorders, so panic disorder or panic attacks. And um, on the face of it, social anxiety disorder does not seem to be uh, the most um, functionally impairing or um, doesn't seem to be a very significant um, anxiety disorder, but it, but it is. And, you know, I see many professionals who experience um, significant anxiety and they'll the first thing they'll do is they'll leave work they'll go pick up a bottle of wine and they'll go home and they'll drink it because they've been so anxious throughout the day yeah um, they will avoid social context and when there is a say a practice meeting or um, so a social event that they can't avoid um, you'll find that they take a taxi there and they'll have had three or four or five drinks before they arrive um, so it's a, it's a significant disorder and, and the substance use more um, um, morbidity should not be um, uh, underestimated. Sorry. Um, I'm just looking, there are a couple of questions. Hi, we're we just having issues with the slides. Okay, all right. Because um, people are typing questions, so I'm, I'm trying to monitor those and I'm a male and multitasking is not my strength. Um, when thinking about um, treatment for social anxiety disorder, uh, I'll, I'll generally start with medication like escitalopram or um, fluoxetine, but other medications like um, fluvoxamine or paroxetine um, and sertraline have a good evidence base. Um, if they don't respond to one or two trials of SSRIs, um, uh, I'll often move then to venlafaxine. Second line agents do include um, citalopram or cipramil um, and gabapentin. Um, and again, uh, gabapentin has a reasonable evidence base in the context of social anxiety. And, and as mentioned before, I'd, my preference if I'm using the pentins is for gabapentin if there is a comorbid um, depressive disorder. So things that, you know, medications that are not recommended are medications like atenolol and propranolol. And quetiapine is not recommended in the context of um, social anxiety disorder. Um, so sometimes a very small dose of risperidone if somebody is presenting with a severe social anxiety disorder is something I'll consider at a dose of about half a milligram um, at night and that that is a sort of an adjunctive therapy that has a good quality evidence base uh, but again I would spend time moving through the SSRIs and then making sure that we're moving people through to um, CBT um, or acceptance and commitment therapy or systematic desensitization um, and making sure they're engaged with the psychologist and, and that that is a core component of their treatment. Having the capacity to restructure your thinking about uh, the worst case, the best case, and the most likely scenario. So what's going to happen when I go and meet people? So what if they notice that I'm anxious? Who actually spends time thinking about my anxiety rather than being in their own head and managing their own life issues? Those sorts of basic techniques have a very strong evidence base and are very effective. Um, in terms of comorbidity, about one in five people will present with a major depressive disorder, and so I treat that as appropriate. But if you think about social anxiety disorder, the economic loss is about 60 days a year, so it's significant. The number need is needed to treat, depending on what studies you're reading and um, uh, which medications are included in the study, is anywhere from about one and a half to 4.2. So, you know, treatment works, um, and there's some data in terms of um, the suicide risk, which suggests, suggests that similar to generalised anxiety disorder, it's increased by about 50%. So when I'm thinking about meeting people with anxiety disorders, I am asking them about suicidal ideation. I am asking them about who their safe person is, if they're experiencing an overwhelming sense of anxiety. Um, have they experienced suicidal ideation? Has it ever evolved to a plan? Um, if it has evolved to a plan, why haven't they acted on that plan? If they have acted on that plan in the past, um, did they seek help or um, were they found? So I'd, I'd look at it in, in a fair bit of detail. And I find that um, developing a, a, you know, a good quality uh, safety plan is always important. And sometimes starting that conversation 
um, by getting them to use an app like, for example, there's the Beyond Now app on Beyond Blue's um, website. We'll often um, start to help them start to think a little bit more about alternate behaviours, what they can do, understanding that if they're drinking and experiencing suicidal ideation, then their impulse control is reduced and as such, um, their risk of acting on suicidal thoughts increases and making them aware of that, providing them with after hours um, contact numbers and, and making sure that if you have the opportunity to speak with a loved one or a close friend or a flatmate, um, that you do so. And, and if a person is experiencing suicidal ideas, that you provide them with additional resources, whether it's relaxation techniques and the effect, effectiveness of deep breathing relaxation should not be underestimated. But there are other apps that people can access. So there's one called Calm, which has a free and a paid component, but the free component is sufficient and teaches people mindfulness, um, anxiety management techniques. And I'd use those kinds of um, resources a, a, across um, the entire spectrum of anxiety disorders. In terms of the evidence base, um, again, like GAD, the evidence base is probably both in combination cognitive behavioural therapy or psychological therapy together with pharmacotherapy um, is best. We know that um, short-term treatment of anxiety disorders is pretty effective. Um, Long-term data suggests that around um, two to four people in 10, so 20 to 40 percent, um, will recover. But the vast majority of people will, will um, need some form of ongoing top up in terms of their cognitive behavioural therapy or talking therapy and may well require long term um, pharmacotherapy. Um, so we know that exposure therapy can also be um, helpful for social anxiety disorder. Um, we know that uh, in terms of CBT alone, like a single 10 course of CBT, 10 session course, not so effective, which is why I've mentioned that people need um, ongoing um, top-up sessions from their psychologist and that there's a maintenance factor in relation to social anxiety. It's kind of sticky um, and it will attach itself to any social situation that a person finds themselves in but also work-based situations. So they have people have to constantly work on their social anxiety cognitions to manage them. There are a range of studies that show that in terms of um, pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy certainly is effective, um, Oftentimes, when I see people with mild to moderate um, social anxiety disorder, then um, I would, I, I guess, I, what I'd recommend is that um, you get them in to see a psychologist first, and then again, if the psychologist comes back to you, so when I, if I write a referral to a psychologist and say, look, I think this person can manage, um, I've, I've spoken to them about pharmacotherapy, they're not interested in it right now. Um, I would like an opinion as to whether you think that they're able to be productive in whatever therapy it is that you're conducting. And, and if you feel as though um, they're not able to generalise what they're learning in each session out into their everyday life and practise those techniques, or they simply forget um, the content of your sessions, then refer them back to me and we'll have a further conversation in relation to um, pharmacotherapy. We know that um, there's a fair subset, depending on which studies you read again, 20, 30% of people who um, may not respond to several medications. And again, my general rule is have a look at other comorbidities, um, look at whether um, there are specific personality factors that are um, I haven't recognised in an initial session with them, um, but also have they underplayed their comorbidities in, specifically in relation to substance use. Um, and if I've tried SSRIs and I've moved on to NSRIs, um, such as venlafaxine, for example, and there's been some benefit, but but it's the symptom reduction is is not as, as significant as I would have hoped. Then oftentimes I'll move to um, gabapentin, or um, sometimes I'll use benzos like alprazolam or bromazepam. Um, and clonazepam also has a reasonable evidence base in in um, social anxiety disorder. Um, so I'm going to move on now, um, and we're covering a hell of a lot of ground. So um, what I thought I'd do is just talk a little bit about panic disorder, and then I'm going to talk about PTSD, which is now no longer an anxiety disorder. Uh, but I, th I think PTSD is important to talk about, um, even though it's kind of been shifted, you know, um, out of DSM-4 into DSM-5 as a trauma-related phenomenon, which it is. Um, but to think a little bit about it, because it's quite a challenging disorder to manage. So, um, in terms of panic disorders, uh, about 
um, four in 10 people, 40% of people will at some stage experience a panic attack, um, but panic disorder is a different thing. Um, people with actual panic disorder experience recurrent unexpected panic attacks, and they experience that persistent concern um, that they're going to experience another panic attack, and that leads to significant behavioural change. Um, and it's a devastating condition because um, it, it completely and utterly changes people's lives. It, it restricts um, their capacity to function without worrying about a panic attack and has significant morbidity associated with it and um, disability or loss, adjusted um, life years lost. That's quite, it's quite significant, again, in the order of sort of 40 to 50, it's quite significant. So panic attacks typically, typically include that, you know, classic uh, sense of impending doom or danger and fear um, or, loss, or fear of loss of control. Uh, and some people actually fear death. And there's a person that I've been working with um, who unfortunately was treatment resistant, um, but his, his, his nighttime experience was that he feared the sun setting um, and he would start to experience dizziness and lightheadedness chest pain, headaches, abdominal cramping, and his parents just didn't know what to do. Um, the, the number of triple O calls and, and visits to emergency department, you would not believe. Um, and, um, you know, this guy um, is somebody who, I, it took me about two years to actually get control of his um, panic disorder. He did not experience agoraphobia, and I'll touch on agoraphobia in a moment. But uh, certainly at, at night time, he would start to sweat. Um, he'd experience shortness of breath. He'd experience a choking experience. And uh, he was not leaving the house. So going from a university student who experienced a panic attack in the context of a lecture, and then his mind started to worry about experiencing another one, had one in the car park, and then started to actually experience daily panic attacks. This poor guy's experience and his life was miserable. Um, we now have good quality control of um, his panic attacks and, and he no longer fears the night time, uh, but other problems have evolved. So we've learned that he also presented with quite a difficult to treat depressive disorder that was very much masked by the severity of his anxiety. And now I'm just getting his mood back and, and treating it what, what has been quite a difficult to shift depressive disorder. So um, again, with the anxiety disorders and specifically um, panic disorder, comorbidity is very common and major depressive disorder and other anxiety disorders is common. And people um, you know, tend to have idiosyncratic beliefs about the connection between an environmental factor and a panic attack. And they tend to develop spurious um, connections between their panic attacks and certain environments and alcohol. And so taking a really good substance use history is essential. Uh, agoraphobia is um, a symptom profile where um, people fear leaving home, they fear crowds, they fear enclosed spaces like movie theatres or elevators or you know, being in a small shop, for example, um, or in um, a mall, for example, as well. Uh, people fear open spaces, they hate being in parking lots or um, crossing bridges is a, another thing that I often ask people about and people become so anxious, they just collapse. They they, they, they essentially um, start hyperventilating if they have to cross a bridge or um, um, they feel as though they're, they're, they're fundamentally going to die. It's a terrible, terrible experience. I've had one patient present telling me that he, he thought he was going mad, um, that the intensity of the panic attacks was so severe and that he had presented to emergency department so many times and, told, and was told that he had um, panic disorder, uh, but it made no sense to him. And that's because this guy actually had comorbid obsessive compulsive disorder and he used to get intrusive recurrent thoughts about um, just pre a panic attack he had, he had experienced the thought that um, he would something terrible would happen to his children so he's very unlucky in that he had this intrusive recurrent obsession that um, every time he had a panic attack something awful would happen to his children and this perpetuated um, and so you know aggressive treatment of both his panic disorder with uh, psychologist as well as aggressive pharmacotherapy um, and then managing his OCD was quite tricky um, but we got control of it over time it took about 18 months so I want you to get a sense that um, when I'm seeing people it takes a long time to get symptom control hopefully if you're seeing people and the symptom onset is relatively new then just putting a lovely framework around it getting them to see a psychologist discussing the symptoms and signs 
spending time educating them about the symptoms and signs, giving them written information, and then offering them, whether it's pharmacotherapy um, or, or a psychological therapy or a combination of both, and reassuring them that you'll be able to provide them with you know, pretty close follow-up if, uh, if need be, and that one can actually get control of these anxiety symptoms. But as they evolve, um, the paradigm that anxiety is sticky and, and, and progresses is a very good one to help people understand that really working hard in um, a psychological therapy is worthwhile because they're pulling back the kind of vines that are growing out as their anxiety um, encompasses more and more of their life. So in terms of pharmacotherapy, first line agents include citalopram and escitalopram, as well as fluoxetine. Fluvoxamine um, has a good evidence base, as well as paroxetine and sertraline, and of course the NSRI, um, venlafaxine as well. Second line agents include alprazolam. Um, clomipramine has a place, but you know um, I'm pretty wary in terms of using tricyclic antidepressants on this, absolutely necessary to be frank, um, because of the array of side effects. And, and as well as the fact that if they are experiencing comorbid um, suicidal ideation, which is fairly common in this disorder, then um, it's a pretty high risk um, drug that you're putting into their hands. There is an evidence base for the use of um, lorazepam and diazepam in the short term. Metazepine is also a second line agent that can be used, but again, the cardiometabolic side effects associated with metazapine are a challenge. And again, I'd use metformin, which I've had you know, reasonable success with in terms of um, countering the cardiometabolic side effects and the weight gain of metazapine, but it does have a lovely sedative effect and the lower the dose, the more sedating metazapine is. So starting at 15 milligrams, helping people get a, a, say a week of reasonable sleep and then escalating to 30 milligrams, which is a clinically effective dose, um, sometimes helps in terms of not having to co-prescribe other medications to help them get a decent night's sleep. Um, and I'll give people a context. It's going to be four to six weeks, eight weeks before we see reasonable um, symptom reduction. Um, and I'll let them know that, uh, you know, in terms of treatment failure, the first medication is, it's, it's about 50-50 in terms of good quality treatment response that doesn't cause side effects that are unacceptable, such as sexual side effects or um, gastrointestinal side effects, headaches, tremor, those sorts of things that, that people often struggle with. So in terms of, Adjunctive treatments, um, clonazepam certainly is a reasonable adjunctive treatment, but again, it's a, it's a fairly heavy benzodiazepine is the way I think about it. It tends to accumulate over time, um, and I'd prefer not to have to um, use clonazepam, but it, the evidence base does suggest that clonazepam and alprazolam, which we all know is highly addictive and, and can be challenging to, to stop, um, those two are recognised by um, the evidence base as reasonably effective. Busperone and propranolol um, and tradazone are not um, recommended um, agents. Okay, so in terms of um, comorbidity, major depression is really common. 35 to 45% of people will experience a comorbid major depressive disorder. The economic loss, I don't like the data on, um, that, that I've been seeing. It makes no sense to me because um, most of the data refers to 36 to 45 days in terms of economic loss. But uh, my clinical experience, which means absolutely nothing when it comes to um, population level data, suggests to me that um, this disorder has much more significant impacts um, in terms of uh, disability, a li adjusted life years lost in terms of impacts on um, occupational function, social function, um, and in terms of disability. In terms of numbers needed to treat, a broad number is eight. Um, so, and I, that, that number just crosses um, me just putting together numbers for um, SSRIs and, and um, the um, NSRIs. Uh, for this disorder, the, the data suggests probably um, CBT or um, a psychological therapy and pharmacotherapy. Um, I'm going to disagree. I think they should always see a psychologist. I don't think this isn't either or. This, if people are presenting with um, panic disorder, um, pharmacotherapy together with um, psychological therapies, I think is always indicated. Round about nine. So, in that context, if people are ex are treated with pharmacotherapy as well as um, psychotherapy, around 93% um, of people will experience significant symptom reduction within two years. Um, and the 10-year data suggests that around 62% or 65% of people will um, experience significant symptom remission. 
Okay. So in terms of um, psychological therapy, CBT alone um, is you know pretty reasonable if you if it's very mild. But aside from that, com combined um, CBT and pharmacotherapy, look out for comorbid major depression. It's often hidden, and as you get control of the anxiety symptoms, then the um, major depressive symptoms become more prominent and you sort of see a seesawing. So you get control of the anxiety symptoms, they drift down, then the major depressive symptoms become more prominent. You get control of them with aggressive pharmacotherapy and then the anxiety disorder feels more prominent for the person. And you see the seesawing effect over weeks and months um, as you begin to ameliorate um, their symptom profile. So before we move on to something that is not an anxiety disorder, and specifically I haven't spoken about OCD tonight because um, that is something that needs an hour, to be frank, um, because it's such an interesting anxiety disorder and is often hidden. Um, and the ways that you 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 should um, assess people clinically um, requires a fair bit of finesse. Um, it requires a certain skill level, and and maybe at some stage in the future. Uh, if you don't hate me after this session, um, I'll, prov I'll, I'll provide a, a session on OCD because it's a pretty interesting disorder and very disabling. So I'd, I'd like to actually um, provide an opportunity for the second poll now to, to be um, put up, please. And this is looking really at how successful um, in your experience you've been in terms of um, ameliorating anxiety disorders. So look, it's, it seems in general, most people have some successful um, experiences in terms of treating anxiety disorders. Um, no one says that they're very successful and um, no one has said that they are completely unsuccessful. And um, I guess that that generally tells us that the anxiety disorders are difficult to manage and difficult to get good symptom reduction in. But if you look at the numbers needed to treat data, it suggests we should be able to get very good symptom control and we should be able to be quite successful in terms of um, ameliorating people's symptom profile. And I guess one of the traps is, whilst I mentioned before that um, you know, there's not much point if you're not getting symptom reduction um, in terms of pushing the dose further, that's an indication for switching antidepressant. But the, comorbid the comorbidities, uh, so for example, substance use disorders, which are often hidden, um, major depressive disorder and other anxiety disorders is often missed. And so, and and people with anxiety disorders are often so um, pleased if they get some symptom reduction that often you might not see them again for a while. Um, and so just, just being really persistent and upfront telling people that we should, we should aim for significant symptom amelioration, if not complete symptom amelioration. And from a, a, a psychological um, therapeutic approach that, you know, whilst people might, for example, have 10 sessions, really encouraging people to be aware of the fact that they shouldn't settle for partial impairment. And neither should we because of the impairment and the economic loss and the um, awful experience that people with anxiety disorders um, have. So I think we should, we should remind people that pushing dose of medication is the right thing to do if there are still persisting symptoms. Working harder with their psychologist is the right thing to do to affect better symptom reduction. Um, so I'm going to move on now to um, PTSD. Um, this was moved out of DSM, but uh, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about it because it's such a difficult um, disorder to treat and it's very easy to miss comorbidity and it's it's a it's such a uh, such a significant issue and I see so many people who have experienced partial symptom reduction uh, five or ten years down the track and they've just lost so much of their life they've lost so much of their function so I thought it'd be helpful just touching on this today and again you know the theme that I just spoke about about being aggressive with pharmacotherapy and getting consent to push harder to get better symptom reduction, reduction um, is worthwhile because the functional gain associated with small reductions in symptom profile is significant. So I'm sh I won't rehash too much about PTSD. It's, uh, well, I haven't spoken about it at all, but I'm sure all of you are aware of it. So um, it starts within one month of a traumatic event. Um, but generally, sometimes you see symptoms actually not becoming evident until 
um, weeks, months, or years later. And there might be other traumatic factors in a person's life that have led to that sort of index um, movement from the accumulation of trauma over time to that step up in terms of the um, arrival of a full syndrome of PTSD. It's common. So around the, the sort of lifetime prevalence of PTSD is around 9% and the monthly rates are about 2%. We know that um, the risk of suicide attempts in PTSD is increased fairly significantly, two or three folds. Um, but we also know that the the negative affect, the alexithymia, the depressive symptoms can be easy to, to miss because of the overwhelming hyperarousal and hypervigilance symptoms. Um, and people report really high rates of comorbid chronic pain. So if you're seeing somebody coming in, recurrent chronic pain, a good, you know, significant trauma history. And when you're taking the trauma, it sounds as though there's developmental trauma um, and it, it looks like a, a sort of a complex trauma history. Look for individual episodes where they, were, where, where, um, they actually feared for their life, um, both within the context of developmental trauma or motor vehicle accident. Um, and I often see people with attenuated PTSD symptoms that just haven't been well managed over years and they, they've just come to accept their PTSD symptoms and they live with them. Um, and they live with those recurrent intrusive memories of um, the, the trauma and um, they relive um, the trauma through flashbacks. But it, people reach a point at which um, they're so racked by um, their experience of those intrusive memories and the flashbacks that they actually, they seem to adapt really well to experiencing them. Um, the main functional impairment is obviously associated with the avoidance symptomatology and trying to avoid, for example, where they, you know, where they crashed their car or um, the house where they lived where they were abused. Um, and that, that has a significant impact in, on, in terms of their, um, their level of function. And, and generally, if, if people have avoidance symptomatology, again, because anxiety, even though PTSD is not an anxiety disorder, is sticky it tends to invade other areas of their life and, the, and their, their life becomes very small um, and on many occasions restricted to a bedroom um, and, and it's an awful experience. Um, in terms of their uh, physical reactivity and emotional reactivity, their hyperarousal symptoms, so door slams, they jump, uh, is so significant they, they start to, may start to engage in self-destructive behavior. They are, you know, alcohol use, substance use, they spend a lot of time um, uh, focusing on their inability to sleep because they chronically just can't stay sleep. They experience poor quality sleep. They're irritable, irascible. Their families really struggle with their PTSD symptom profile. And you start to get a breakdown in the family unit, which then correlates with you know, overwhelming feelings of shame or guilt in associated with the primary trauma and then what they've done to their family. They also experience profound negative thoughts about themselves, they experience depressed mood, and they feel hopeless. And so, uh, um, again, a very careful history looking at suicidality is, is critical. There are uh, four... Hi Martin, I just wanted to flag, it's eight o'clock, we have about 15 minutes left for questions, um, so however okay. you want to use that time. All right, I'll be really quick. Um, there are four first line medications um, that have a good evidence base for PTSD, that's fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline and Effexor venlafaxine. There are good quality psychological therapies that help people. Um, Eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, CBT, and trauma focused therapies and exposure therapies have a great evidence base. So, um, aggressive treatment and not um, accepting second best in terms of symptom reduction is critical. Have to keep pushing hard to make sure that um, people who present with PTSD uh, are not left with significant residual symptoms. And if they are, refer them on to a specialist. So I'm going to share my screen with you now, and then we're going to open up to questions. So, so what I've tried to do, because in other talks I've given, um, most people are really interested in numbers needed to treat. I haven't got numbers needed to harm data here, but just thinking, you know, you, you need something that's very straightforward and simple. What medication to use? Um, what uh, common comorbidities are, what the suicide risk is and what the prognosis is. So I've put this together for you in a table and I'll have some slides which I'll um, ask uh, the wonderful organisers of today to, to make available to everyone. So I thought I might open the floor up to questions now.
Excellent. Um, yeah, we, we did have some initial, I think, comments just at the start around the slides. So um, I'll get through to the actual questions itself. And um, I think with a few of these, uh, there is a bit of a, a case study example with it, but I, I'll try to get to the questions just, just for the sake of time. Sure. Um, so the first one is, uh, what can we try, drugs or even any natural treatments that may work in patients for anxiety and depression other than serotonergic agents? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so starting off with education. Um, um, I've just got something up on my screen, but uh, hopefully people can still see me. Um, starting off with education um, is critical. Help people understand what the symptom profile is. That's the first thing. Second thing is offering them um, access to a psychologist who likes to work with whatever anxiety disorder it is. Helping them understand that um, basic stuff, uh, daily exercise, avoiding caffeine, avoiding alcohol, taking a good quality substance use history, of course, um, interpersonal connectedness, you know, trying not to shut down in terms of their um, social networks is, is is critical. Getting excellent quality sleep hygiene is critical as well. Making sure they have a regular time when they go to bed, that they've got a good quality sleep routine in place, that they switch off their screens, they get up at a regular time. Um, in terms of alternate natural therapies, quite frankly, um, the evidence base is fairly weak um, and I tend not to recommend anything into, by the way of sort of natural therapies um, and I, I can't actually tell you whether things like St John's Wort have um, any evidence base for the anxiety disorders at all. I think it's pretty weak for major depression but reasonable um, when it's mild major depression but um, aside from that I wouldn't recommend anything else. Um, I hope I've addressed that question sufficiently. If not, I'm happy to follow up later. Are there any other questions? Um, yep, so next question uh, is around a, a new drug, I think it is. Um, so what is the role of the newer anti-anxiety slash depressant agomelatin? An example, if uh, didn't, so if the, if the client didn't um, tolerate or couldn't use SSRIs, um, how effective is it and how common is the liver failure and is it reversible if doing regular LFTs? Also, okay. is it in the first few months and just generally does the drug work? That's a great question. Um, so in the context of, um, I don't use it much to be frank. Um, two main reasons. Uh, first is um, evidence base is okay for agamelatine um, in relation to uh, social anxiety. Um, outside of that hasn't been studied that much. Um, one of the key things is that when I bring people in, I, order, I always order baseline LFTs, and as I mentioned before, either three or four weeks, and then three, six, nine, twelve, or four, eight, twelve, depending on what you read. Um, in my experience, is that uh, deranged LFTs is fairly uncommon, uh, but it certainly causes panic because you spend a fair bit of time educating patients about the risk of it. Um, I there are so many other medications aside from Valdoxin, it's expensive. Um, I would want to know, first of all, what I've missed um, if somebody can't tolerate an SSRI. So, and sometimes I'll send them off for, for pharmacogenomics um, just to get guidance around what they actually can tolerate. Um, but if I have to use um, Valdoxin, it's expensive. You have to do the LFTs. You don't have to do the LFTs long term. Um, so I think after the baseline and the initial series of LFTs, I'd be doing it twice a year. Um, in terms of uh, efficacy, the literature suggests that it's reasonable for um, major depression. And if you look at, there's a meta-analysis, um, where is it, 2018, uh, I think it's British Medical Journal. That was a really good quality meta-analysis that brought together 5,000, uh, no, that's not correct. Sorry, 742 studies and about 5,000 odd people involved in those studies. Um, and it's it's about mid-range. Um, in terms of the side effect profile, it is relatively well tolerated, doesn't have sexual side effects, which is good. Um, SSRIs, you know, around 10 to 15 percent of people will experience significant sexual side effects. Um, and that that is difficult to manage when somebody has, you've come along, you've got control of their anxiety disorder and they're experiencing sexual side effects. And in that context, 
um, you know, it, it, it certainly is challenging. But I, I would not use it as a first line agent um, because of expense, because of the, the, I guess, the testing, unless somebody's come to me and they've tried several SSRIs and NSRI or two, and there's reasons why they can't tolerate them. Uh, but as I said, pharmacogenomics has been really quite helpful. I certainly don't test everyone, but if I see people um, with a history of not being able to tolerate two or three SSRIs in one NSRI, um, I'll send them off. It costs about $140, and the guidance is helpful. And you can you can actually speak with a, a clinical pharmacist afterwards and have a conversation in relation to um, any advice on what medications might be helpful. So hopefully I've answered that question. Is there an, are there any other questions? Yeah, but we're actually getting quite a few questions, so hopefully um, we do get a chance to, to address them. Um, we try to get through as many as we can. So the okay. next one is, uh, again, around SSRIs in young adults. So what is the evidence about giving SSRIs in adolescents slash young adults and increased suicide? Um, mm. and so I'm often worried about prescribing them to this group if they don't live at home and not a yep. lot of close contacts to monitor or help them. What should be done? Um, often CBD doesn't always help. Yeah, yeah, I know. And if you look at the general guidance, the general guidance is be really careful with SSRIs in this group. Um, fluoxetine is the only really approved medication for um, people sort of under the age of 18, um, in the sort of older age group, 18 to 24. The black box warning applies to increased risk of suicidal ideation. So it's how you actually work with that. Um, and how you work with the family system and how you work with the child uh, well, or the adolescent and, and discuss the risk of suicidal ideation. So if you are going to prescribe an SSRI um, such as fluoxetine, then making sure that you have a good quality safety plan in place. And if you're not comfortable developing it that, then ensuring that there's a psychologist involved, that the parents are engaged and that you've actually worked with the child to understand that suicidal ideation is a feature usually of a comorbid depressive disorder, but if it's not, it's a sense of loss of control over their life circumstances and starting to work with them around that and creating options for them which allow them to not act on suicidal thoughts. So for example, sometimes I'll work with a paradigm, like for example, if I if I put, um, what's, your, what's the food that you don't like? And this might seem trite, but it's not. Um, and they might say to me, oysters. And I said, right, if well, if I put a kilogram of oysters in front of you and I told you to eat them, would you do that? And they'd say, no. And I'd say to them, well, but I'm a specialist. And so tell me why I'm recommending that you do so. And they say, well, I, I don't like oysters. And I said, well, the experience of suicidal ideation cannot be a pleasant one for you. It's a thought. And oftentimes what I'll do is there's a couple of nice studies that do that's functional brain imaging of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. For example, the depressive disorders is actually a, a Mayo Clinic proceedings paper. And I'll show them what happens when people are very anxious or very depressed and what brain changes occur. And I'll talk to them a little bit about the fact that, you know, if we shut down anyone's prefrontal cortex, generally they'll experience suicidal ideation. And I'll work with that paradigm to then allow them to understand that suicidal thoughts is an experience that occurs as a symptom in major depression or occurs as a symptom usually in an involving um, major depressive disorder in the context of an anxiety disorder. But then you have a whole group of kids who have experienced significant trauma who experience suicidal ideation because associated with that trauma um, is a sense of unsafety, the hyperarousal, hypervigilance symptoms. And it's important not to miss those um, symptom profile and to actually have a really good look at their trauma history and, and try and elicit that, that history either from the child, if appropriate, or from a family member. Um, in terms of the risk, look, it's a black box, box warning. Um, in terms of um, the association between increased uh, suicide rates in children and adolescents and SSRIs, generally um, SSRIs are indicated because they reduce that overall rate. But at an individual level, there is an increased risk of experiencing suicidal ideation. So one occurs at a population level, one occurs at an individual level, and they're different. So with, at an individual level, yes, there is an increased risk and you work with that person around managing that risk. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. Refer them on to a psychiatrist um, or try psychological therapies first. I'm ready for the next question. Yep. So the next question uh, is just around uh, the psychiatry support line. So can you yeah. uh, talk to us a little bit about the psychiatry support line, any other 
uh, relevant services that GPs might find useful. Yeah, sure. Um, so the GP psychiatrist, well, I'll give you a, a potted history of it. So the GP psychiatry support line is designed um, to provide um, access to um, myself or one of my colleagues. Um, everyone in this um, group here at ProCare is an experienced psychiatrist. Um, and we'll try and take your call immediately. Most of the time we will, um, because generally we're not going to be doing um, an, a whole lot of additional clinical work. We'll actually be waiting for your call. And, and it's one of the great parts of our job uh, is being able to provide you with advice when you're in a difficult situation as quickly as possible. We'll also provide you with a sort of a written um, spiel of what we've said so that if you need to refer to that, or if you want to pop that in your notes, it makes it easy for you um, after the consult. I think it's pretty unique. You know, um, when I, I used to be um, the director of a mental health service and, and I did set up a similar thing um, and, and it was partially used. Um, and, and so the utilization of it wasn't sufficient for me to keep it going. Um, but the utilization has been really good. The feedback's been great. Um, and for us, um, being able to work with our um, GP colleagues, uh, it, it's actually um, one of the most enjoyable um, experiences I can ha we can have. And at a population level, we can have a significant impact together with you. And um, we do take repeat calls and we can follow together with you, we can follow individuals and, and hopefully bring people to a state of health and manage them in a similar way to um, the management word institute, but through you. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, we do have quite a few questions, so I'll just try to get through as many as we can. Uh, next one, people with significant childhood sexual abuse uh, with resultant self-harming are often diagnosed as borderline personality disorder, but should it be DSD instead? That's a great question. Um, when it comes down to diagnosis, you know, the utility of a diagnosis is paramount. The utility of borderline personality disorder until the development of DBT as a therapy was discriminatory at best, to be frank. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the diagnosis. People generally with borderline personality disorder are very impaired um, interpersonally, you know, within a social context in terms of their life trajectory. Um, so I see that as um, a very severe level of disturbance with recurrent and uh, you know, very recurrent um, requirements for hospitalization. In terms of CPTSD, for me, that's a diagnosis that is one associated with hopefulness um, because many people who have experienced childhood trauma, A, can identify with the symptom profile, feeling different from all other people, um, have very unstable mood. So the mood fluctuates you know, quite intently, uh, intensely, depending on the environmental factors that are driving the mood. So understanding that the mood is like a cork on an ocean and the environment is driving their mood. And that relates to their traumatic experiences and how they encoded environmental factors during the trauma, which are now being triggered, not as a conscious event, but unconsciously, because they're more hypervigilant and searching the environment for risk. So I find it a, a diagnosis I can work with a lot more. The people I work with um, feel that it's a, a label they can understand and make sense to them um, and uh, allows me to create a treatment narrative that makes sense both to the person I'm working with um, as well as myself. And so for complex PTSD where people are um, very unsafe, I can start to work with them around the fact that yes, suicidal ideation is really common, that um, risky health behaviours that lead to significant physical and psychological um, morbidity and indeed mortality is best avoidable and this is how we go about it, starting with a trauma-informed therapy, whether that's um, working with um, an EMDR, you know, eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing um, or a other form of trauma, other type of trauma-informed therapy. Um, people find it very helpful that um, I can work within a team-based approach um, around their trauma, developing a very clear safety plan, looking at what their risk factors um, for self-harm and for suicidal ideation are, um, and making sure that you're not missing um, a comorbid major depression, which is extremely prevalent for people who've experienced um, complex PTSD and PTSD in the context of um, significant developmental trauma is something that is often missed and you can treat and you can do things like 
uh, help people with their nightmares by using um, a dose escalation protocol of prazosin, so starting at one milligram uh, at night when they're getting to bed and increasing the dose by one milligram a week can get people can give people significant um, symptom uh, relief. Oftentimes, the dose profile might be in the sort of 10, 20, 30, up to 40 milligram um, dose range for prazosin. But if you get control of the nightmares or you get a significant reduction, people don't wake up in the morning activated, hypervigilant, and aroused. It gives them a better start to the day um, and, and sig makes a significant difference. Um, so I'm always vigilant about making sure that uh, I don't miss PTSD in the context of a construct like complex PTSD because they can co-occur. Okay, right. is that all? Um, yeah, look, we'll, we'll try to do one more and I think with the rest of the questions, because there are quite a few, we might just um, uh, keep them somewhere and, and get you to provide maybe a written response at a, at a later time to those. Um, I'll, I'll do my best, yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, you can see this is definitely an area that, that we need need to talk around and discuss further. So the next question um, is mostly around medication management. So how do we switch from one agent to another? Uh, wean off or when do we start it? Okay. Um, what I can do is um, sort of take more pharmacological risks. Um, so look, in general, um, medications, for example, like, it's a very broad question, so I'll try and address it as best I can. Um, for example, if you're weaning somebody off an SSRI, um, where the short life, the half life is relatively short, so let's say up to 24, 36 hours, um, the need for a one day washout period, if you've if you've walked them through a dose de-escalation protocol, so for example, person on 200 milligrams of sertraline, typically I will reduce the dose by 50 milligrams every four days, bring them down to 50 milligrams, and then I will cover a person with short-term lorazepam, um, and that might be a BD or TDS dose and something um, that, and the lorazepam will, will be prescribed to help them sleep at night together with some melatonin. I'll spend time, a fair bit of time, educating them about withdrawal symptoms. Uh, but for example, if I was moving somebody from sertraline to venlafaxine, now venlafaxine is an SSRI at doses below 150 milligrams. So essentially you're moving them from an SSRI to an SSRI. Now common wisdom is that you, you, know, you, you do need to allow for a day washout period. I, I tend not to do that. I, I will talk to people about the risk of a serotonin syndrome. If I'm providing a bit of benzo cover and I'm telling them to stay well hydrated and if they're concerned, contact me. And if I'm doing the change, I'll do it on a Monday, not on a Friday. Um, then generally, I, I will often cross taper. Um, there are certain rules that should never be broken, like um, tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And I don't have time to go through all of that today. But you will all be aware of those rules that you can make people really sick. So there are certain rules that cannot be broken. But in relation to my experience with serotonin syndrome, um, to be frank, I've seen it when people take an overdose. Uh, but generally, if I dose de-escalate in a reasonable fashion, um, and then start at, so for example, if I was, if I was cross-titrating, say, sertraline to venlafaxine, I'd start a person on 37.5 milligrams of venlafaxine the next day after the last dose of sertraline, and I'd move them to 75 milligrams of the XR four days later, um, and then I'd give them a week or two at that XR dose, and then see if I need to push it further.